Hi everyone, my name is Kiran and I'm an NBE certified echo enthusiast. On today's screencast, we will be talking about a practical approach to diastology. When I was studying for my echo exam, I recall struggling to understand the meaning of the various E, A, and E prime waveforms. I hope that this talk demystifies these concepts for you. Diastolic dysfunction is defined as abnormal relaxation, abnormal filling dynamics, and decreased distensibility of the left ventricle. In diastolic dysfunction, the LV requires elevated filling pressures in order to fill adequately. Why should you care about diastology? While much of the heart failure literature focuses on abnormal systolic function, abnormal diastolic function is just as important to recognize and provides insight into the pathophysiology behind many disease states. Conditions that are associated with diastolic dysfunction include hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and several cardiomyopathies, including hypertrophic, restrictive, and dilated cardiomyopathies. Furthermore, as diastolic dysfunction worsens, left atrial pressure increases to maintain adequate stroke volume. This results in pulmonary congestion in the form of edema and systemic venous congestion. While we're going to cover some concepts outlined by the 2016 American Society of Echocardiography Diastology Guidelines, I want to highlight some important caveats. Firstly, the ASE algorithms on detecting and grading diastolic dysfunction are based on expert consensus and have been poorly validated across studies in comparison to invasive hemodynamic assessments. The values in the algorithm have not been validated in critically ill patients, especially if they are mechanically ventilated. Furthermore, these values are only relevant when performing transthoracic echocardiography. All the values we will derive today are load dependent. In other words, the numbers change depending on the volume and capacitance of the cardiac circuit. Finally, from point of care echo perspective, some parts of the algorithm are impractical and its relevance to bedside management questionable. Given all those caveats, let's move on to a few important points to keep in mind. The first is that all patients who have systolic dysfunction will have diastolic dysfunction. Abnormal contraction cannot be present without abnormal relaxation. Secondly, the numbers we will talk about are relevant to the left ventricle only. The right ventricle has slightly different numbers and they are not as well studied. Finally, remember that blood moves from an area of higher pressure to lower pressure. This concept will help you understand how E, A, and E prime waves are derived. The first step in the ASE algorithm is to identify patients with diastolic dysfunction. Recall that patients with systolic dysfunction will always have diastolic dysfunction. Thus, this first step only applies to patients with normal systolic function, with normal EF used as a surrogate. If diastolic dysfunction is present, the next step is to quantify the severity of diastolic dysfunction. For exam purposes, please review the algorithms. Today, we will focus on deriving and understanding the following values, E, A, E over A, E prime, and E over E prime. We will not be covering peak TR velocity or indexed left atrial volume. Let's first talk about the E and A waves. At the end of systole, the mitral valve is closed as the left atrial pressure is lower than the left ventricular pressure. We can imagine these to be 12 and 14 respectively. Place your pulse wave Doppler gate in the LV, just distal to where the mitral valve leaflet tips meet. When the LV pressure falls below the LA pressure, the mitral valve opens. In early diastole, you can imagine that the LA pressure is 12, while the LV pressure is 8. Thus, a pressure gradient exists between the two chambers, causing blood to flow from the chamber with higher pressure to the chamber with lower pressure. Remember that pulse wave Doppler tracks the velocity and direction of blood flow. As blood enters the LV, it moves toward the ultrasound probe that is located by the LV apex. Thus, the pulse wave Doppler will record a positive deflection as blood enters the LV. This is called E-wave for early diastole. As blood enters the LV and leaves the LA, the LV pressure increases while the LA pressure decreases. At some point, the chambers equilibrate to the same pressure. Since there is no more pressure gradient, blood stops flowing and thus its velocity is zero and is termed diastasis. Next, the LA contracts during atrial systole. This increases the LA pressure above the LV pressure, which again creates a pressure differential between the chambers that drives blood flow from the LA to the LV. This creates another positive deflection termed the A wave for atrial systole. 
This marks the end of diastole, and the left ventricle then starts to contract, which increases its pressure and leads to mitral valve closure. To measure E and A, simply take the peak velocity of each curve. E over A describes the ratio between the E and the A wave. Normally, the E wave should be slightly bigger than the A wave. However, normal aging is associated with impaired LV relaxation. Thus, in the elderly, the E wave might be slightly smaller than the A wave. As a result, the normal E over A ratio is between 0.8 to 2. What are some caveats of calculating the E and A waves? Firstly, these are highly load dependent values. Increasing LV preload by, for example, giving a fluid bolus to a healthy person increases the E wave peak velocity much more than it affects the A wave. Thus, changes in loading conditions can change the relationship between E and A. Secondly, Arrhythmias will lead to changes in the E and A values, as they can cause partial or complete fusion of the waves. AFib results in the loss of the atrial contraction, and thus no A wave is present. Due to variable cycle length, you need the average of at least 10 E waves to calculate an E value in AFib. Furthermore, mitral valve pathology, such as mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis, change the E and A waveforms. Thus, these waves are not reliable when these pathologies are present. Finally, patients with certain pathologies such as hokum will have different E and A values at baseline. Let's move on to E prime. Two important anatomic landmarks are the septal annulus and the lateral annulus of the mitral valve. These describe the attachment of the mitral valve leaflets to the LV muscle. E prime reflects the movement of these two muscular points during diastole. To measure the velocity of muscle tissue, you must use pulse wave Doppler along with tissue Doppler. This is often found as a button called TDI on your ultrasound machine. Place the pulse wave Doppler on the septal annulus of the mitral valve to calculate the septal E prime. Next, place the pulse wave Doppler on the lateral annulus to calculate the lateral E prime. Recall that in early diastole, LA pressure is higher than LV pressure. Thus, blood flows from the LA into the LV. As the LV fills with blood, it expands circumferentially and longitudinally like a balloon. This causes the septal and lateral annulus to move away from the ultrasound probe that is located at the LV apex. This results in a negative deflection termed E prime for early diastole. Diastasis occurs when the LA and LV pressures equalize and LV filling stops. Thus, there is no movement of muscle tissue. Finally, when the LA contracts, the LV again fills with blood, causing the septal and lateral annulus to move away from the ultrasound probe. This results in another negative deflection, termed A prime. Note that the ASE algorithms focus on E prime and not on A prime, so don't worry about this wave too much. Normal E prime values are more than 7 for the septal annulus and more than 10 for the lateral annulus. This is because the lateral annulus is not tethered to other structures like the RV and can move more freely than the septal annulus. What are some caveats of E prime? Well, E prime values are less load dependent than E and A, but there is still some load dependence. E prime values are not accurate when there is regional dysfunction of the LV, which causes some segments of the LV muscle to move slower than others. Finally, E prime values are not accurate in diseases that affect the mitral annulus. These include mitral annular calcification, surgical rings, a prosthetic mitral valve, and pericardial diseases such as constrictive pericarditis. This slide serves as a reference for normal values. To calculate E over E prime, you first have to take the average of both the septal and the lateral E prime values. Then, calculate the ratio between E and the average E prime. Normal values should be less than or equal to 8. We will now look at what occurs to these waves in diastolic dysfunction. In grade 1 diastolic dysfunction, the LV pressure is now 10 rather than 8 in early diastole. This is because the LV has trouble relaxing, leading to a higher resting pressure. Since the LA pressure is still higher than the LV pressure, blood still flows from the LA to the LV. However, since there is a smaller pressure gradient between the two chambers, the velocity of blood is also lower as it enters the LV. This results in a smaller E wave than normal. Things are unchanged in diastasis as the two chamber pressures equalize. Since the LV pressure is higher than normal, the LA adapts by generating a much higher pressure during atrial systole. This restores a high pressure gradient between the two chambers, 
resulting in blood flow from the LA to the LV. Since the pressure gradient in atrial systole is greater than the pressure gradient in early diastole, you get a big A wave compared to the E wave. Thus, in grade 1 diastolic dysfunction, the E over A ratio is less than 0.8. What about E prime? Well, because the LV muscle cannot relax as much during early diastole, a smaller E prime wave is produced. Importantly, however, both the E and E prime waves decrease by the same amount. Thus, their ratio is preserved, and in grade 1 diastolic dysfunction, E over E prime is still less than or equal to 8. In grade 2 diastolic dysfunction, the LV pressure increases further to say 12 rather than 8 in early diastole. This increased pressure is transmitted to the LA, resulting in increased LA pressure from say 12 to 16. Since LA pressure is higher than LV pressure, blood flows from the LA to the LV. Notice that this pressure gradient of 4 is the same as the pressure gradient in a normal heart. Thus, a normal-sized E wave is produced in early diastole. In diastasis, the two pressures equalize and blood stops flowing. During atrial systole, the LA generates a slightly higher pressure than the LV, which causes blood to flow from the LA to the LV. The A wave produced is of similar height to that of a normal patient as the pressure gradient is the same. As you can see, the relationship between E and A looks normal. Thus, grade 2 diastolic dysfunction is often referred to as pseudo-normalization. What happens to E prime? Since LV relaxation is further impaired, the muscle moves even more slowly during early diastole, producing an even smaller E prime wave. You now have a normal E wave, but a smaller E prime wave. Thus, the E over E prime ratio increases to somewhere between 8 to 14. Finally, let's talk about grade 3 diastolic dysfunction. The LV pressure has increased even further from 8 to 16. This is again transmitted to the LA, and the LA becomes dysfunctional to the point that its pressure increases sharply in resting conditions. The large pressure differential between the two chambers leads to the production of a very tall E wave. Diastasis occurs early, as the pressure rapidly increases in the LV as it fills. Thus, the E wave is not only tall, but narrow as well. In atrial systole, the dysfunctional LA can barely contract to generate a pressure differential between the chambers. This produces a very small A wave. Thus, in grade 3 diastolic dysfunction, the E wave is much bigger than the A wave, with the E over A ratio being greater than 2. Since LV relaxation is very impaired, the muscle moves very slowly during early diastole. Thus, the E prime wave is very, very small. You now have a very tall E wave and a very small E prime wave. Thus, the E over E prime ratio is large and more than 14. A quick way to estimate LA pressure is to take the E over E prime value plus 4. This summary slide outlines the different wave patterns and values you see, depending on the grade of diastolic dysfunction. As you can see, in grade 1 diastolic dysfunction, LA pressure is still less than or equal to 12. As diastolic dysfunction worsens, the LA pressure worsens. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening and see you next time.